I guess I'd better get going. Hi, my name is Lars Albertson. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'll speak to you about how to build, today, how to build data pipelines. Um, as everybody else, I have done things. Uh, one turning point in my career was when I joined Google nine years ago now, uh, at the height of its hype. Uh, I realized then that the, uh, one of the sort of edges of, and reasons for Google's success was their ability to handle data at lo with large volumes of data and to extract value from it. I got the opportunity to join Spotify later to uh, build data processing infra infrastructure at scale and then moved on to Shipstead to build a new data processing system from scratch. I'm nowadays uh, freelancing, building these things for clients. How many people here have uh, seen and understood a uh, Spark or MapReduce word count program? Right, a fr good fraction of the audience. How many feel comfortable with taking a MapReduce or Spark program and making a product out of it? Oh, a couple of people. Um, well, good, that's the gap that I hope to bridge with this session. Um, I will throw a lot of information at you. I, I uh, usually prefer to watch talks that go fairly fast. So uh, I, I have way too many slides, and I will throw them out fairly fast. If you miss details, if you miss things, that's fine. Not a big, I'm trying to communicate sort of the big picture to you. You can go back to the slides later. You can contact me with, for questions and so forth. Um, I will, I will say, do this, do that, uh, build it like this, don't build it like that. But there's, of course, not one single truth in how to build these things. What I will give you is some kind of base recipe, a good starting point that will be in the vicinity of, of state of the art of state of practice. And I will give you some technology suggestions. Uh, I won't do it like a full review of available technologies, but give you a starting point uh, that you can use to compare with other technologies. Um, there are some things that I won't cover. I won't cover the coding itself, because that's so widely covered out there. Uh, and I also won't uh, cover stream processing, because it's in practice quite complex if you want to build products out of it. So um, unless you're desperate for real-time answers, stay with Batch. All right, this is what a data product looks like from a sort of bird's eye point of view. You have uh, things generating data, or, or databases where you have data on the left. Uh, there's a process called ingrace, where you take that data and put it in what's called the data lake. Um, and then you, from that lake, you compute things. You build pipelines that eventually spit out things in what's called an egress process. Uh, spits out things of some kind of business value. Exports to your customers, or notifications, or uh, indexes for data-driven products, such as uh, recommendations, or, and so forth. Um, and also, uh, you spit out aggregations to be used for business intelligence and analytics. If you look at this, and compare to a standard computer program, it sort of looks the same. You have, in, you have human interfaces, you have input, you have a computation in between, and you have output and some kind of, of display. It's sort of all the same but on a different scale. And since it's all the same, the uh, best practices and good advice that apply for, for any type of program also apply for, for data processing. So if you see something in a data pipeline that would be a smell in your normal program, then it's a smell in the data pipeline as well. This is often forgotten. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's fairly common to, to when it comes to data processing to see lots of uh, like global variables and state and, and hard-coded output paths and, and so forth. Um, there are cultural reasons for that, but the way to remedy it is to throw in a mix of, of uh, people that react strongly and act when they see these things. Uh, they tend to work differently from, the, from data engineers and data scientists, and there tend to be a tension if you if you do mixes, that tension is good. In the, in the balance in between like providing quick value and building strong products, you, you, can, you can make uh, great data-driven pro products. 
So I'm going to zoom in on, on each of the parts here. Um, your input to, to the data lake, input to the data processing, is event, comes from events and databases. Uh, events is a, a representation of everything that your users do or that other systems do. And they tend to be generated on unreliable devices, such as mobile phones, or, or processed uh, via unreliable entities, for example, stateless gateways. Some of these events are, are super important and, the, and uh, of gold value to everything that's human generated, typically. So what you want to do is, as quickly as possible, throw it down from the uh, unreliable entity, from your gateway server, for example, to something that's reliable. And the state of practice today is, is to use something called Kafka. Uh, it is a replicated service. It is a, it is a, uh, uh, it is a log. It's, a, it's an append-only log where you, you add more and more events. And it's immutable, so you only append things to it. Uh, and then eventually, you tap off that log into your cluster storage. The default cluster storage it's used today is, is the Hadoop file system, but there are options as well. And the log, everything that's in the log and that's being tapped to HDFS is, is known as the unified log. It's the history of all events that have happened uh, in your system since the dawn of time. Um, you can make this to be highly reliable and also used for real valuable events if you do a synchronous handoff from the unreliable, de unreliable devices to your log. Because once they're in the log and they're replicated and you get an act from the log, uh, they, are, uh, they are guaranteed to, be, uh, to, to be eventually be delivered in the, even in the face of single machine failures. You can use the same system both for, for reliable or for high value data and for low value data. Uh, the only difference is, is, the, uh, is in the handoff, synchronous or asynchronous. And then from the initial Kafka cluster where you drop the things, uh, there you, if, unless you have the computation uh, cluster, storage cluster on your same site, you want to transport things over the internet from one data center to another. And there are mirroring tools for doing this uh, because the, the uh, clusters don't span data centers. Uh, things, sometimes these links between the data centers go down and things will take time to transport. That's fine. As long as they're in one of these uh, clusters, eventually they'll, they'll get to the destination. And uh, Kafka and the similar uh, technologies, uh, for example, Kinesis or Google Pubs Hub, uh, unlike other forms of event passes, they store a long history. And that's what makes the whole thing robust. Uh, and long means like weeks or months or even more. There are other companies that store all of their history in, in Kafka. And so when things go down, further downstream, eventually, they eventually catch up because all of the history is kept. And in order to make these, things, these, systems, these collection systems reliable, uh, you must keep them simple. Uh, and so don't do, don't do no processing on the, on the path. There, there, it's often very tempting to like decorate things and decorate with geo and all sorts of things. Do no processing until they're safely stored in the cluster storage. The only thing you should do on the path is what you cannot do later, which is to add timestamps. And it makes sense to add timestamps at generation, at registration, and at arrival. We'll use these timestamps later. So the... The stream that comes in is, is a stream of individual events. In order to be used for computation, you need to cluster them in what's called data sets. So at arrival, you bundle a bunch of these events, for example, all of the events from one hour or from 50 minutes or something. You call it a data set. And once that time bucket has passed, you say, you seal the data set and say, I will, no, I will no longer write anything to this data set. They, these, they need to be immutable to be, to be useful uh, for stable downstream, downstream computations. And you want them to be uh, bucketed in a sort of predictable manner, for example, in the, in, uh, on, on a fixed time interval. Okay, so that was event collection. Uh, now you, have, you might have some, da uh, some um, original data in databases that, that you want to get into the, your cluster storage as well. 
You should never do uh, like analytics computational computation directly to production databases. We'll see why in, in a minute. So you want to take snapshot from them and, and store them in the cluster. So the naive thing to do would be to use a, uh, a tool for this. There are, there are for example, this is for example a tool called Scoop, which, which will run a MapReduce job and, and suck out a, a, a SQL database. And that turns out to be an excellent way of taking down your production uh, databases. Uh, there, there's a war story here. Uh, uh, at, when I was at Spotify, we had the, some of the user information in, in Cassandra, and we were dumping that Cassandra days, database daily. Cassandra is very scalable, it, it used to handle the load. And one day we had so many users that the daily dump took 25 hours. So then we had this, not one spike, but the double spike, and then it could no longer handle the load. So the, the login team uh, decided that this was not a good thing because it prevented users from logging in and put a firewall between the <laughs> cluster and the, uh, and the Cassandra database, and then we had to figure out a better way. Likewise, it's also common to see people uh, go direct the, the cluster towards the, the online service, the API, instead of the database, and that's, of course, an excellent way to take down the, the online service. This happened at Shipstead, while I was not paying the proper attention. Uh, so there are a number of different ways. You can see I have some extra slides at the end with, with the different vari varieties. The recommended path is to use the, the standard backup functionality of your database. To take, that's typically efficient, atomic and so forth. You take a backup, you copy it to some offline storage, and you bring up a, 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 an offline slave that, is, that, has no touch, that doesn't touch the online world. And you use whatever tools you, uh, there to uh, dump it to your cluster storage. Um, some people argue that taking snapshots of data bases uh, doesn't really make sense because what you use them for is typically to join with events that happen in the system. But the events don't happen at the same time that you took the snapshot. There's always a time discrepancy there. Uh, usually you can live with that type of discrepancy, but some information is lost in the process and sometimes this is not acceptable. So what you can do is to jump on the uh, religion of event sourcing which basically says that we should never have any source of truth in databases. The only source of truth is this unified log, the, the append-only log of events that have happened. And if we want to take a snapshot or a view of, of the current state, then that view is the sum of all events that have happened until now. Uh, so that matches well with data processing, because then you can use your standard data processing tools to build a view of an, any arbitrary time. The uh, applications that you build, however, they tend to still need some kind of view uh, of the current state. So then you have to compensate by building that view. And there are a couple of different uh, variants here that you can, or patterns that you can use to keep uh, a, an event log in sync with the database. You can, in your service API, replicate the event. So one, one change goes to, goes to the database, one to the event log, at the risk of discrepancies in between. There are tools that will create an event log from the commit logs of, of for example, MySQL or, or Postgres databases. That's great because you can use the internal tool, but then you have to work at the lower level with the database objects. You can also say, okay, we never uh, touched the database from the, from the service and uh, use stream processing to keep your database view up to date. Then you introduce a latency in, so that the da database is lagging a bit. Is anybody out there doing any of these things? Oh, we have an event sourcing geek here. Excellent. I'd love to hear more about it later. Okay, uh, I've been in a couple of fires related to taking snapshots of the database, and, and uh, the things that I learned is to keep the offline world separate from the online world, because the offline world is very toxic to online services. You want to you know, have a fence in between. And also, whatever team that owns data in database must own the task to export it, because they since they, it can destabilize their system, they must own the stability, and it also affects what, what kind of databases that you use. Some are easy to dump, some are hard to dump. Okay, so now we have all our events. We have snapshots of our databases, and they form our data lake. Uh, it might also make sense to like external import from other entities, uh, but 
technical and not so interesting. So, interesting, so I'm not going to go through it. Um, this is a pool of raw data, raw original data. And you, once you put it there, you never touch it. It's immutable. And everything downstream is derived from this raw pool of data. And in order to cover for mistakes that you might do downstream, you want to keep this for as long as possible. Uh, according to the, the uh, Lambda architecture, you want to keep it forever. That's unfortunately not com uh, compliant with um, like privacy rules, at least the ones that we have here in Sweden. And the data in this data lake is technically homogeneous, so all the data sets more or less look the same. So a data set is either a collection of similar events or a snapshot of a database at this point. And they are parameterized. So a data set instances is this bunch of events, but there are many similar instances that differ by parameters, and usually time is often present, present in these parameters. So the add impressions for one hour might be one data set, and the next, the next hour is another data set instance, but they both belong to the same data set class. And all of the instances in one class have a compatible schema. I'll get to schemas later. And the concrete uh, representation of, of such data sets in the data lake and in the pipeline processing uh, is a directory uh, with multiple files. So each directory or one data set instance. There are multiple in order to uh, enable you to process them in parallel. And while they're being written, new files are added, but after all files have been written, they are sealed with, with a, uh, a file called success, which is, I believe is a convention that comes from Hadoop. But many tools uh, adhere to these conventions. The, there are a couple of formats that make sense to have in these data sets, and they all include the schema. Uh, for incoming data, it's common to have JSON coming in. JSON includes schema with every record. Uh, but as you process later, uh, it might make more sense to use either Avro or Parquet, uh, which also bundle the schema along with the data set. Uh, the, some people are used to, uh, to serialization formats such as protobuf and thrift that, do not, in, that were, do not include a schema because they were intended for RPC scenarios. In RPC scenarios, you have a predefined convention on, on what the schema is like, uh, and, and they, are, they produce and consume are synchronized. That turns out to be difficult in data processing because the producer might have pursued, produced the data several years ago and that becomes very difficult to like, synchronize externally. Um, so therefore, you bundle the schema. And there are lots of tools that understand these bundle schemas and uh, are able to do smarter things. <clears throat> this is what it can look like in practice. Uh, HDFS is basically a file system. Uh, and the first components of the path uh, identify the, the data set class. The later components of the, uh, of the path are the parameters of your data set. Uh, here I have included a, a privacy level of the data, data set, we'll get to that later, and also a schema version. That's uh, not so common, but it might make sense. Uh, and the uh, parameters use uh, key, key equals value notation. That's a convention that I believe comes from Hive. It turns out also that many tools understand this convention and uh, are able to do smart things with it, such as partition the data in, in a good way and so forth. So you want to stick with that convention. Right, for the ingress and egress uh, parts, it makes sense to have uh, data sets uh, represented in other ways. For example, uh, if, if you want to push things to a service, you might want to put push it out to a database where you can do lookups. If you want to do BI on it, you might want to put it in, in MySQL or something. Um, in these cases, the, for the data sets that are produced uh, by pipelines, uh, they should also, similar to, to the, your Hadoop data sets, they should also be like uh, atomic, written once, and then immutable, never changed. 
You don't have to do it that way, but that's a good way to preserve your sanity. Um, schemas. A schema is essentially the enumeration of different types of fields uh, in your records. Uh, th there's a word called schemaless, but there's no such thing as a, as a schemaless data set. There's always a schema. It's either a schema or write. You enumerate the fields and the types when the data is written. Or there's a schema on read. There's a, an assumption in your code of what fields would be there and what types they would have. Um, and whenever schemas change, they can change either in compatible ways, for example, adding fields, or they can change in incompatible ways, like removing fields. If they change in incompatible ways, you, you need to define a new data set class, or things will be, get complex. And that's why uh, there was a version number in the earlier, earlier slide. That's a, a simple way to make a new class. Um, schema on read or write, uh, neither is better. Uh, but as Brian Getz said yesterday, uh, there is some, in some cases, one is more suitable than the other. In, in schema read cases, it's easy to change the schema. It's easy, for example, to add new fields because w whatever code is reading, uh, reading things don't care about the new fields. It doesn't even notice them. Uh, if you have schema on write, it's easy to, to build a system where you can have static typing and you can map your, your records to, to like uh, Java or Scala classes. And uh, static typing is very valuable if you want to build stable production code. Uh, I have another uh, Spotify war story where I made a mistake once. And uh, that mistake could easily have been caught by static typing, but it wasn't. And uh, four million users were affected. The quality that the, of, of the effect was not that big, but never, the, num the sheer number uh, made me a bit frustrated that it was so easy to, to sort of uh, affect so many people. And my uh, colleague next to me tried to comfort me and said, well, you know, if you stand them up next to each other, they reach all the way to Arbisco. Or to Amsterdam. <laughs> so um, if you can avoid these situations with static typing, that's, it's worth the investment. So in the, in the upper right corner, uh, you'll find the, the part where static typing might be more valuable. That's when you have production pipelines pushing out things to services that actually affect users. Uh, whereas in the lower part, uh, if you're interested in the, in the business intelligence, it's very valuable to be able to add new fields to your, uh, to your Android clients or to your web pages and have them propagate without having to make any changes in between and, and turn up in, in, uh, in SQL or in, in your graphs. Uh, if you have to make lots of releases in between, uh, then this, can, this turn around for, for like experimenting with things can be really slow. <laughs> All right, we have data sets, we have schemas, time to process them. From the link, uh, you typically make a chain of, of batch jobs where you sort of refine the, the data more and more. You often need to wash it. The, uh, you need to shuffle it in time because it might have gotten reordered from the generation to the point that it arrived. There might be uh, duplicated events and so forth. And then you, you often decorate your, your events with uh, uh, demographic information about your users and so forth. And then you, as, as you flow to the right, you become more and more like application specific and, and in the end perhaps produce a, a like, uh, similarity matrix for recommendations or something. So uh, what tools should you use here? Uh, and the, um, the tool of, to recommend here is, is Spark, for good and for bad. Uh, there are a couple of alternatives. It's, if, you have, if you anticipate having lots of data, it's important that this tool can scale up uh, and parallelize. It's also important, however, that it can scale down. Um, for example, good old Hadoop MapReduce is not very good at scaling down. It's hard to write simple things. It's hard to run them locally. Uh, scaling down is important in order for you to be, be able to iterate quickly and run quick experiments, run on single uh, 
uh, with small data on single machines and also to do integration testing locally. All of the tools mentioned here support a local mode where you just run it in your machine. Uh, programming languages, that's a, a touchy subject. Um, there is a simple, straight answer here for uh, what language to choose in, in data processing, and that is Scala. Uh, this, no matter what you think of, of your favorite languages and so forth, it's not really about whether the language is good or not. This is, this is like a people uh, question rather than a technical question. You have two types, two main types of people involved in these projects. There are data scientists, and there are software engineers, and then the data engineer, which is something in between. And uh, for data scientists, the, the uh, ceremony and boilerplate and syntactic overhead and, and procedural overhead of, of Java tends to sort of kill enthusiasm. It makes it really hard to do quick experiments. Uh, so if, if left to their own devices, they usually prefer languages like Python and R. On the other hand, if you, if you take an experiment done in Python and R and give it to a software engineer, responsible software engineer, most of them will say, hey, yeah, fine, I can translate that to something, you know, with static typing and good ecosystems and so forth. And that's not Python. Uh, and uh, Scala is the only language that, that sort of bridges between these two worlds. Uh, and I've had the, the joy to work with some, some very good data scientists that are, are fairly proficient in Scala. They're able to do quick experiment. And it, rather than rewriting all of the code, we could just take the code, solidify it a bit, add more testing, and put it in production. That, that's a really efficient path. And for these reasons, uh, Scala is the home of all the, uh, of all the innovation in big data today, essentially. Um, so if you were to choose another language, you're essentially saying no to lots of these information. So if, if you decide to, make sure you make the cautious choice. There are a couple of drawbacks with Scala. The, I think the most irritating one is that uh, a big part of the community has been sw smoking way too much Haskell. And although they write some very impressive libraries, they tend to do so in ASCII art. So it becomes completely incomprehensible. To, to mere mortals. Right? Uh, so if you th see things like this, all of these are valid operators doing something meaningful in, in good, in high quality libraries, right? So if you see the spaceship, then you know you have a culture problem. You need to get, like, push that away. Right? The left one is actually called Operator Spaceship, officially. And the middle one is called the TIE Fighter. Anyway. So your job, after you've written it, should ideally be a pure function. It should, it should only uh, depend on its input, and it should predictably produce the same outputs, more or less the same outputs every time. It should not do things like lookups in online databases, anything like that. You can do it, but you will, uh, you will make things more complex, and you will run into trouble later. It should preferably be idempotent, so that you can run it multiple times without any harm being done. And in a similar way as we have the data set uh, classes and instances, we have job classes and instances, where a, a job instance produces a, takes a number of data set instances and produces some, some data set instances as output. And the job class is the generic version without parameters. Uh, and these instances are executed when the inputs arrive. So this is like a, like a build system. Uh, it's a common misconception that they are executed nightly or something. Don't do that. You want to execute them when input arrives in order to make things stable. Because inputs will sometimes be missing. Uh, and upstream jobs will fail and, and go wrong and so forth. So if you have to redo these things, um, and if you, if you bet on a nightly schedule or something, then, then you will have a fragile system. And when things go wrong, you need to some, have some kind of automation that re, retries things that have gone wrong. Many errors are transient. Somebody might have fixed the bugs and so forth. So you arrive at some kind of eventual correctness. Given enough time, we will eventually produce the right output. But you're in batch mode, so you, you do have some time. You're, uh, you're not under real-time time constraints. And the tool to help you with this is called the Workflow Manager. 
It's the uh, sort of data processing equivalent of, of a build tool, good old GNU Make, for example. And it detects when, when inputs are there, when outputs are missing, it runs jobs. Uh, and it has to, uh, some kind of tooling for backfilling, which is the process of rerunning things that might have failed. Uh, all of your jobs, all of your pipelines, they form a direct acyclic graph, and the workflow management tools have a DSL to dis where you can describe that graph and how to run, thing, how to run the jobs. And so forth. Uh, good such tools also the, include the ingress and the egress parts, not only the parts in the middle. Uh, so, for example, they can have knowledge about how to write data to, uh, to a SQL database or to a Cassandra co column family and how to detect whether it's missing or present. And the recommended tool here is, is uh, Luigi from Spotify, which I have a kind of a love-hate relationship to, uh, because it's a great tool in many ways, but costs us a bit of grief as well, but it's definitely the best thing out there. And this is what it might look like. In this code example, I have omitted the actual uh, commands for, for running the code. If these were Spark jobs, uh, you would have, uh, they would include the jar and how to invoke the job and the, uh, uh, and so forth, and, and lots of uh, parameters and knobs and so forth. I've only included sort of the DAG piece with their dependencies and, uh, and the output in one case. And the, the picture on the right is the, roughly the DAG that is, is described by this piece of code. Uh, so you can see the parameters here, the data or parameters, uh, and the, each, each job class is represented by a Python class, and each job instance is represented by a Python instance, and so forth. And there are some tools out there that are incapable, uh, that are capable of doing the, the pipeline piece, but they're incapable of, of expressing the uh, egress tasks and, and so forth uh, in a good way. And some of the simpler tools also are incapable of describing complex DAGs. Sometimes these DAGs turn, uh, turn fairly complex for good reasons with, with dynamic input data sets depending on what's available and so forth. So you want to, you want to pick a tool with, with a strong DSL. Right, so we have computed a bunch of things, now we're going to spit it out so that you can create some value. And if you are, are uh, building data-driven applications, you want to spit it out into some kind of database where you have a service that can serve it to users. Um, if you don't know what to pick here, Cassandra is, is your default choice, but there, there are many people who have lots of options about these things, so I'm sure you have a favorite one. Uh, in the, in, back in the heathen days, we used to have uh, relational databases to store all the information, and then upon request, we would do joins to get the information out that we need. Uh, nowadays, in order to, uh, in order for, to serve uh, results quickly to your users, we would sort of pre-compute these joins, and that, the process is called, is called denormalization. And spit out a table or in Cassandra a column family uh, where one query is basically enough to, to get all that you need for this particular service. It could be your, your notifications or your, your order history or whatever, all pre computed. Uh, this is useful for, for serving applications. If you want to do analytics, you, uh, you instead export to something uh, where you can place dynamic queries and, and SQL databases or some. This, some, some of the scalable SQL variants are, are sort of the lingua franca still here. Uh, in these scenarios, usually the data, you can shrink the data sufficiently so that it will fit in one machine. Okay, so you have built pipelines, you've spit things out. Uh, in order to get production quality, you need to test these things, and more importantly, in order for your, pro, for your developers to be productive when changing these things, you need to have them tested. That's actually the driving force be, behind testing things in, in data processing. Remember that the batch jobs are pure functions. That means they are easy to test, input, output. So test at that interface, either one job or a sequence of jobs. Uh, you, you, unless you have very 
complex things inside these things. You don't need to, to go into the de de nitty gritty detail level and do all of the dependency injection ceremony and so forth. You're fine testing at the course level. So in order to test a single job, uh, my recommendation is to test a full job that reads input and output, reads and writes input and output locally from your file system. This, your job will probably take uh, URI parameters for, for its input and output location. If you just replace them with file colon, slash slash yada yada, uh, you can run the job locally and, and do the integration test locally. They integrate really well with your, with your uh, continuous integration, your ID, you can debug them in, in IntelliJ and so forth. Um, it, if you begin at this, it's easy to, to sort of check in your, your test input and, and expect the test output. Don't do that. Instead, generate it with code. Uh, the reason is that it the checked in uh, or committed input would be a bit hard to maintain. For example, if you want to cha uh, change fields, uh, you need to go, all, all, go over all of your checked in test inputs and change the fields. Whereas if you have the code, it's, it's fairly easy. There are a number of tools out there that will. Uh, that uh, are tool that are sort of component specific, for example, Spark specific, that will test, test your business logic. Usually, they don't test your IO. So although they, some of them are really good, uh, I would not recommend uh, using them and instead test the whole job with IO as well, because otherwise you're tied to specific components and there are often lots of bugs in the IO. So you can put this together to test full pipelines of jobs. Um, there are two ways, two reasonable ways to do this. One is to hack your workflow manager uh, uh, or ha hack your workflow configuration so that it can run on local data sets instead of production data sets. Uh, that can be a bit tricky, but it's, on the other hand, you are re really testing the workflow logic as well. The, the, the simpler variant, which is the upper variant, uh, which I would recommend, is to make custom test pipelines that consider, consist of the same jobs that you have in your production pipelines. <coughs> and you just run them as a, as a single multi-job. Uh, in this one, you can run in, in CI and in your ID and so forth. You have to maintain a separate test pipeline, but that's uh, probably worth the effort. All right. You've written the code, you've tested things, now put it in production. Uh, and what you need for a pipeline is, is the, the code, typically when you built it, it's JAR, some configuration, and the, and the DSL. In, if it's Luigi, the, the Python files. These belong together, so bundle them together and deploy them as one unit. At Spotify, we used to put the DSL inside the JARs, which was a bit weird, so at Shipstay we did it the other way around. And we put the jars together with the DSL inside a, a tarball installed with, uh, installed with PIP. Uh, and then Luigi doesn't is actually a scheduler, so it's, it needs cron to, to kick it off. And jobs that you expect to run at circuit frequency, frequency should be kicked off by cron at a higher frequency. So for example, the daily jobs, you run one now and so forth. Because every hour then they would check, is this job satisfied? Is this job satisfied? And if your input data is late, then you only have to wait for an hour until it kicks in again and, and it's, it's filling up. And then you typically ask Luigi to backfill the previous days if they have failed. And you throw these cron jobs out to multiple workers, identical jobs to a farm of workers, also called edge nodes. And the Luigi central uh, daemon will ensure that you know, each job only runs on one node. And if your jobs are small, they can definitely run on these workers. That's how you should start. Uh, if they're big, they'll be, uh, they can use a, a attached cluster. Now, it's actually easy to uh, convert this into a continuous deployment pipeline. You do the same, but you uh, also create a little script that looks at in your cluster file system where you store all these tarballs and you cron the latest and greatest thing. You want to have a, a container in this case, and the, the simplest container that you can use, since it's Python, is virtual and you can use Docker if you, if you prefer as well. All right, uh, I would definitely recommend to, to start very simple, because most people have, have data and jobs that fit in one machine. 
and will continue to do so because it doesn't grow faster than Moore's law. Some people don't. Uh, but if you have these simple jobs, and if you take a cluster infrastructure to run it, then these cluster infrastructures, such as Hadoop and Spark, they're really expensive to operate and maintain. So if you can get away with running things in one machine, do so. so th and that's how you should start. And you can cheat by shrinking your data and use approximate algorithms and so forth and get up and running with a, with a proof of concept. Get the workflows up and running. Get the integration test end to end up and running, but, but keep it small initially. And then as you scale, do so if, only if it's needed, only for the jobs uh, where this is necessary and do it in an iterative manner. And keep focus on the, on the sort of developer cycle so that this is sufficient. Okay, there's one thing that you need to plan in advance, and that's how to protect users' privacy. Uh, on the Swedish law, there, uh, there are a couple of things that you need to care about. There are lots of things to be said about privacy. I'm going to focus on, on the technical aspects of it, how you could sort of implement uh, the techniques necessary not to be bitten downstream. You need to be able to uh, delete users if they ask for it. And you need to be able to forget information that is uh, very old, for some, some definition of very old. And you need to, to limit the uh, access uh, to, for, for, of your employees to, pr to privacy sensitive data. And you need to audit who has access to what data. Don't take my this as legal advice, but that's roughly the things you need to care about and plan for. So in order to delete all data, what you can do is you take a, a, the data sets that have been derived from a piece of data, and uh, you discard the, the original raw data, and you promote these derived data sets to the data lake. You can no longer uh, rerun that first part of the computation, but your downstream workflow still works. So this is a, a simple way to do it. You just have to have some mechanism to do it. In order to remove users, you need to adapt your, your data model so that the, the information that you want to remove can be discarded. You don't want to remove everything. You typically, it's typically fine to, to store like an anonymous user, play this song or watch this web page or whatever. That's fine. It's, the, it's the, the sensitive parts that you need to remove. Um, this was all nice until I connected this screen. I'm sorry about that. Um, and if you haven't prepared and separated out the PII sensitive data, what happens is that the users' names and addresses and messages will get sprinkled all over your data, your, um, data platform. Not only your lake, but, but your derived data sets as well. And then reprocessing and recovering from that uh, with like terabytes or petabytes of data is really expensive. So that's why you need to plan in advance. And also, once you have removed users, you need to rerun your processing so that, so that a removed users are actually washed out eventually. And then in order to audit, in order to, I, I, rec I would recommend that you like, classify data sets. We use the red, yellow, green uh, pattern at chips then. Uh, and audit the, the accesses to red and yellow ones. Um, the, for manual usage, what we did at Shipster was to have a gateway tool, so that all data access went through one tool. And that turned out to uh, work uh, really well, because we, then we, it was possible to, to log everything, every access of that tool. And it also enabled the data scientists, because they, they, they could discover the data functionality through that tool. And for batch jobs, you need to figure out what has actually been run in the past. And it's sufficient if you store with each batch job, if you log the, uh, like the commit hash of, of the source code that we used to run that job, because then you can go back and say, OK, we have this sensitive data. Here's the source that was processed. Data. You, you probably uh, don't need to use this, but uh, this is the kind of things that you need to be prepared for uh, if, if uh, if, the, uh, it, it, if you end up getting privacy audited. So. Some parting words. The main one is keep things really simple. Right? There's, there's lots of ways to go lost here. Don't start by buying a, a, a like 100 nodes per cluster. Keep, you know, do the simple things iteratively and so forth. Um, and everybody's hiring, you know that, but I'm actually for hire. I do these things on a freelance basis. Let me know if you want help. That's my shameless sales plan. Questions? Sorry. Yeah. We have a couple of minutes.
come in if everyone has questions. If you don't, I'll be around for, for another few hours. Thank you.